the deal. Um, it's pretty easy thing to, to, and honestly, if I, I would have had to have moved times around, it wouldn't have mattered that much. Yeah. Yeah. Same two o'clock, three o'clock. It actually gave me a chance to have lunch. So, <laughs> well, that's actually kind of what I was doing. I, I went with, uh, I went with what would be a, a decent time for most people in Europe and then what would be a decent time for me. And then, you know, cause I actually lived in Berlin for three years. So I, I kind of, I kind of have a better feel for, or a good feel for what would be a decent time for either time zone to work out. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, Berlin is, it, is cool. I've been there, but, um, and I have a lot of friends who live there um, mm -hmm. at the moment who, who got out of Dublin because of Dublin being so expensive. Um, but I think Berlin is expensive now as well, to be honest. The prices, I, I, I think the prices of living there has, has really sort of skyrocketed. Uh, a lot of it had to do with, so the East German side uh, was actually relatively cheap to live into, but as those buildings had to be torn down and replaced, they built new buildings and it just got more expensive to move in and property taxes in Berlin have gone up because they have no industrial base. They've got nothing to support their economy at all. And uh, it's really strange because Berlin, um, it, so every state is kind of responsible for generating their own income uh, to pay for their expenses. Well, Berlin has no way to do that, and there's no way for it to tap into the federal budget. So it's it's just a weird uh, situation they're in because they're not really a state, but they are a state, but they're a city. It's it's a weird. Uh, they're in a weird spot over there, but I enjoyed living there. That's yeah. We've been reminded of that lately with the war in Ukraine and how slow Germany have been, rather yeah. than all the other European countries. Really, yeah. To, oh yeah. Um, yeah, they are um, crazy slow. But anyway, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> okay, so what uh, I've got the recording going. What I'll do is I'm going to, uh, I'll do the recording. Uh, I usually do the recording of the beginning part, the 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 front matter with the person on. It just makes for an easier transition. Uh, so I'll go through that. And at one point, I will... Um, I'll ask you to tell us about yourself and then it's all very natural. You'll, you'll pick up on it. It's, I've got questions. They're really open-ended. Uh, they're designed more for giving us a chance to kind of um, explore where we want to explore. If there's other conversations that crop up that look like, Hey, we'll go that direction. We'll go that direction. Um, I try not to make it too rigid. Yeah, don't worry. I know the rough format now because I've been listening to you. Um, <laughs> well, this was, this is funny. It's funny listening to you because sorry, there was one episode when you were talking about how you know podcasts and the idea that they're timeless, really, and that they're yeah. that, that, that they exist everywhere. And I was in this this wood doing this big walk that I do, so literally in the middle of nowhere, holding my phone and thinking, "God, here I am." <laughs> yeah, it, it once you create the content, it never goes away. It's always going to exist somewhere out there in the in the universe and it's pretty profound actually it's it's profound just like a book i read recently <laughs> all right so um <clears throat> let me uh oh no i'm out of coffee oh well whatever <clears throat> all right here we go Welcome, fair listener, to this, the next episode of All Things Writing. I am your host, Brian Nowak, and I'm thrilled to be here along with you on our journey through the writing world. If you got here on accident or you were anxiously sitting by your podcasting device waiting for the next show to come out, I'm just thrilled that you can join us today. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. My favorite thing to do in the world is interview amazing people. And I'm really amazed when people actually reach out to me for interviews. So uh, a while back, I was approached by the good people of HarperCollins Publicity and asked if I would be interested in interviewing my next guest who would have a book coming out under the Mariner Books label. I took a quick look at the author and the book and I was intrigued since, uh, as you've heard me say before on this show, this was out of my wheelhouse, and it would give me a chance to dig into something completely different than my norm. The book I'm talking about is uh, Seven Steeples, and honestly, it, it could be dismissed as simply a look at seven years of a couple's life and nothing more. 
But at the same time, there is so much more going on here. And I'm willing as an author and a regular book reviewer to tell you to read this book. Although it's off my norm, as far as reading goes, it was captivating. There was so much more going on here than, than meets the eye. And a lot of it turns out to be deeply personal to the reader and kind of in many different ways. I would commit to saying that uh, we as a reading community probably need to read this book. And I'm even gonna go out farther on a limb to say there's a very important lesson Seven Steeples teaches us. Uh, oh, Sarah, I forgot to ask you, Sarah Baume or Sarah Baum? It's Baum. 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 Okay. I, um, you having lived in Germany, you're probably better able to pronounce it than me. <laughs> um, well, it's so it sounds like it's a, it's a last name that had an umlaut that dropped off. Yes. Yeah. It's my, um, my ancestors were from the north of England. So it's like the name is so old, they couldn't even pronounce it properly, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So I'm going to say Sarah Baum. Yeah, that's fine. Perfect. Okay. Uh, let's see. Author Sarah Baum is here with me now to take a closer look at this book and tell me if I'm right or wrong. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me today, all the way from Ireland. Yeah, I really hope that um, you can hear me well enough. I, I just, I don't understand how, um, how, how technology works. So it seems almost like a miracle that I'm able to talk to you today. <laughs> Well, that's uh, honestly, uh, you're coming through just fine. And I'm, I'm very, very excited that uh, we can make this work. And to be honest, I have no idea how any of the technology works either. I just know it kind of happens. <laughs> so before we, uh, before we get into my questions, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself before we, uh, we, we dive into the pages? Okay, yeah. Um, so I uh, I live here in Ireland, um, way down on the south coast. Um, I always think, though, I'm sort of on the southwest coast, so I always think that my view sort of that I look out towards America, that there's nothing between me and the east coast of America, really, other than water. <laughs> and I don't know whether I reflect on that in the book, actually. But anyway, um, so I'm uh, in my late 30s. This is my fourth book. And Two of them, two of the previous ones were novels, and then my third book was nonfiction. Um, my background is actually visual art, um, so I studied sculpture. I specialised in sculpture, and um, and I I did do a master's in creative writing um, quite a long time ago now. Um, but generally, my background was visual art, and I came to writing fiction from writing um, art criticism criticism um, and art reviews, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and I live um, with my partner um, in, <laughs> it's, I'm laughing now because um, I know Brian has read the book and as soon as I start talking about my life now, he's gonna start recognizing things. <laughs> so I live with my partner in a very rural um, location in an old farmhouse and we have two dogs. Well, that's, how convenient is that? Two dogs. Hmm. Well, we'll get more. We'll get more into that in a little bit. Uh, you know, and you and I actually have a connection uh, that goes beyond just uh, the book itself. I was pulling. I, I was like uh, clawing through your bio a little bit and, and seeing what uh, what you've done. And uh, you're sort of an honorary Midwesterner American, uh, if I'm not mistaken. You you have a connection uh, to Iowa. Yes, yeah, I noticed this as well in your, your biography. Um, well, I mean, honorary. I spent three months in Iowa City in 2015, and it was as part of the International Writers Programme that, um, that the university run there. Um, and it was, it's kind of connected to the Iowa Writers Workshop, but not, I mean, I just, I remember maybe doing a few workshops with those students. Um, essentially, it was, um, it's, it was 33 um, writers from 33 different countries all around the world and um, I mean it was more or less a kind of a residency but but we were doing a lot of stuff you know with each other and as part of the community as well um, so yeah I mean it was such an interesting experience it was surreal almost um, 
that I lived in Iowa City for um, <laughs> for three months. And I, I still remember, um, I remember the place so clearly because it seemed very um, vast to me um, and very, um, very much more uh, bucolic, I suppose. You know, there were deer in the city <laughs> and there were like chipmunks and raccoons and, and the nature I remember more than anything. Um, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, my wife is actually from Iowa, which I thought was amazing. Uh, so like, like I said, we have that connection. We have that Midwestern connection. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Seven Steeples takes a look at a period of two people's lives over the course of about seven years leading into their eighth. Now the characters, Belle and Cy, and their dogs, Voss and Pip, occupy this rental house where they seem to have just kind of given up on what we would say is a normal life, maybe. But I get the impression that you don't see it that way. Uh, and, and I'm asking sort of a loaded question here because I know you're going to say, well, no, they haven't given up a normal existence. They've transcended into something else. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you answer that because I love when I get the chance to ask the author the question directly. So uh, what do you see this, this, uh, this life of theirs uh, becoming or is? Yeah, you know, it's, um, I mean, as I kind of suggested earlier, the book is based on my own life, but it's very much an extremity of um, the version of, of the life that I live, you know, and every book that I've written has has done that. Um, it's sort of taken the things that I know, the world that I know, but stretched them into more interesting terrain, or introduced things that are you know, not true, but um, perhaps more interesting. I think every writer does this really, whatever um, whatever kind of a book you're writing. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess, so initially I, I wasn't thinking about them as um, um, as withdrawing in the, with the same kind of um, decisiveness that, that they ended up doing in the book. Um, and of course, like the context of the book changed enormously because I finished it Brian in 2019 mm -hmm. and then the pandemic happened and um, I know in America there were different versions of, of lockdown and different durations but um, in Ireland we were quite severely locked down um, for 2020 throughout periods and then there were more periods throughout 2021 and, um, and suddenly everyone knew what it was like to withdraw from society and to um, and and so that became an element in the book because I um, I thought what I thought it's kind of interesting that I created this scenario about these two people who who withdraw from the norms from normal life, um, and then it sort of happened. Normal life changed completely, and everyone was forced to do that. Um, but it's funny, yeah. I, I no no one has ever asked me the question in such a clever way. I suppose you know uh, perhaps what I should say is that they're they're you know are they creating a new kind of existence that is normal for them because they both have this misanthropic tendency in the first place so for them is it, it it's sort of completely natural to live in the way they do and it's other people who look in and view them as being um as being strange and and that's what <clears throat> that's what i loved about the um kind of the idea behind this transition that happened to them is uh from the outside world if you're if you're outside the looking glass uh, you're you're seeing them as sort of these odd, they're like kind of odd ducks. But I actually have a question based on that, which I think if you liked, if you thought my first question was interesting, you'll, you'll like my second one. But I, I want to ask you about the names, though. The names are interesting because Bell being synonymous with a loud noise and Psy is sort of the complete opposite, Bell, Psy. Uh, and I, I, Pip and Voss are very different kind of antipodal uh, versions of a dog. Um, so am I right that you created them in that way? Yeah, absolutely right. I wanted the names to uh, sound something like uh, their personalities, I suppose, um, or their 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 spirits, or <laughs> perhaps is a better way of putting it. So, um, so I mean, the names are Isabel and Simon, Bell being short for Isabel and then Cy being short for Simon. Um, so I felt that they were, so, you know, that they were acceptable as names. Um, and Bell is sort of, yeah, she's a louder personality. She's, uh, she's brighter and lighter, perhaps. Um, whereas Cy is uh, kind of lugubrious and, and, uh, and, and moody <laughs> and gloomy. Um, um, but then, of course, that changes as the book 
goes on. But initially, I wanted those names to, yeah, to say something. And it, it, I'm always obsessing about dog names. <laughs> um, but uh, Voss was, is, to me, it's so essentially like a small, scruff, scruffy terrier type of a dog. Um, and then Pip is, um, is a lurcher. She's like a, a greyhound, more or less. So she's sort of tall and, and elegant. And um, yeah, so to me, the names were really important. I always spent a really long time agonizing over the names of characters. Um, is this something you do as well, or does it come naturally? I think that uh, for me, uh, you know, the names, I, I've been thinking a lot about names lately because I, I've been working on a couple of short stories and a couple couple smaller pieces. And uh, I, I don't think the names mattered as much to me when I first started writing as they do now. I think now I'm more attuned to... Um, not overusing certain names. We always talk about, you know, the, the, the 12 apostle names as being the most common names that, that you hear. So trying to avoid those names on purpose. So we're not regurgitating names that are already out there and, and have a little bit more fun with the names as we go along. I actually am working on a short story now where I resurrected the name Harold. <laughs> You don't hear the name Harold much anymore, but I'm like, you know what? I'm going to bring it out and I'm going to make it a family name too, because why not? As a surname. <clears throat> yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, no. As a first name. As a first name. Yeah. It's funny. As soon as you say Harold, though, I have such a, uh, a stereotypical sort of picture in my head of what a Harold is. <laughs> yeah. 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 Absolutely. Right. But I I decided to, uh, to, to play with, I think names names are important names matter in in my first novel i had fun with this as well because the character was actually never named but his name was ray and i referred to his name as being um i think the word for sunbeams and for winged and boneless sharks so it was kind of like i never named anyone well i mean there was only about two characters in the book but their names were um were were um given away by little descriptions of of other things that their names were if that makes sense well, you may actually, uh, not only do you hold the record as being uh, the farthest away interview I've ever done, but you may be the only person in the history or future of all things writing that have has ever used the, the phrase uh, winged and boneless sharks. <laughs> so thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so do you, and, and I hinted at this earlier, do you think Cy and Bell are hermits? Well, I mean, do they become her hermits? I mean, what is, uh, do you, are you born a hermit or it, does it depend upon the decisions that you make in life? Do you know, are you just born with this tendency <laughs> and whether or not you live alone, you're a hermit um, or, or, or is a it a question. lifetime choice, you know? <laughs> I mean, actually, uh, in both cases, yes, they probably are. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's interesting because, um, when, when I saw the, when I saw the two, so, so Belle and Cy go into this house and uh, over the time period, they seem to withdraw into themselves, but they find out more about that world. That world, to me, as I was reading that world that you would think of as shrinking, if you're looking at it from the outside, if you're actually looking at it from the inside, almost seems to expand. Yeah, yeah. I feel like there's a lot of <laughs> emphasis on to human characters in it, whereas for me, the landscape was perhaps the most important character. And then the house is an important character as well. Um, and, you know, for me, in a way, like I say, it's my third novel. I was sort of setting myself the challenge, a bit like you, you often talk about setting yourself challenges as a writer all the time. And, Absolutely. And um, for me, it was like, how much can I shift the emphasis from, from the people in this book onto the scenery of the book? You know, everything that's boring, really, and you shouldn't write about. Um, but I feel like if you write about it well enough and if you keep, keep it there to being a reasonably short novel. Um, so, like, for me, I, um, I had lived in this place where I still live now for about a year, and I'd just been walking up the same road every single morning up the road, down the road. And I was so, uh, it just struck me one day how much changed 
and yet how little changed, you know. So on the surface, this road was the same, but in its details, it had changed utterly over the course of the four seasons and the kind of damage that had been done by weather and by time. Um, and initially I thought, I wonder, could I write a whole novel just about this one road? And so that was what the book started as, but then obviously it did, it did expand and take in more things eventually. Well, so the symbol, symbolism of the mountain as a central cast character uh, figures very prominently. And it, it, you say it has a million eyes, always watching uh, these four lives seemingly melt into one. Uh, how did you settle on the mountain as playing such a definitive role? I, and I love the mountain, by the way. <clears throat> Yeah, well, again, based on truth, like we live, um, I'm not going to call it a mountain because it really isn't, but we have this landmass that's kind of behind our house. And there is apparently a path that goes up it. It's really not even a hill, but it's sort of long as opposed to, um, to, to high. And, it, and there would be a pretty good view from it, I imagine, because we're, we're on quite high land anyway. Um, and, and it completely came from the fact that we kept, we, we thought that someone had told us that there was a path that went up to the top. So we kept intending to climb it. And in a way, it was the more that we thought about it and didn't climb it, it became to seem like a mountain. And that was the intention in, in giving it the prominence that it has in the novel. I wanted it to, to in fact be something very small, but for it to grow in, in their imagination um, over the course of the place. And it's also, it's sort of like romanticizing somewhere that you've just moved to, you know, um, that you tell your friends that there's a mountain outside the door, whereas, and because it seems mountainous to you because you want it to be beautiful and, and significant, whereas in fact, it's not at all. So, so that was based in truth, but I also wanted the mountain to have this sort of godlike status, like, in my head, it, the mountain is the narrator. That's the one that's telling the story because it can see everything and it knows everything like God. Um, and in a way, it, the eyes, uh, like all of the eyes that it starts with is sort of magic realist, but it's also sort of true because uh, any any sort of you know patch of wild land will be full of insects that all have eyes. Um, and, and so, you know, I don't really think of the book as being magic realist. Um, I think of it as being realist, but of sort of um, having, th but that I wrote it looking at the world in a sort of a magical way, perhaps. I don't, I don't think we do that often enough. If you consider, um, you know, I went, I went and walked my dog this morning and there was a deer standing in our path. And uh, instead of running it away, it, it sort of approached us out of curiosity. I, I think the world, we intentionally push that magic away from us. And I think that's, that's a mistake. We should see the world as, as more magical. Um, you mentioned the house. What role did the house play for you as you were crafting your, your, your novel? Well, <laughs> I spent a lot of time listening to the house, to this house. Um, the house is very much, well, it, to be honest, the house is, in the book probably is, um, it breaks down a lot more than the house that I'm actually living in has done. Um, that it's, uh, it's also sort of partly based on the last place that I lived that really was a terrible dump and got worse and worse and worse over the course of time. And uh, again, it's just what I was talking about, this kind of you move in and like everything is beautiful and wonderful and you clean it up and you paint the walls. And then over time, um, you know, the walls get scuffed again and the windows start to cloud up. And, um, and so it was, I was as interested in that really um, as I was in the relationship between the two people. It was, it was the, how their environment changed over time and how everything just sort of, um, how everything decays and falls away and is destroyed eventually. Um, mm. Entropy or atrophy or, <laughs> um, or whatever we call it. Um, so that was a really important part of it. Um, and I suppose as I started off being interested in in the road and the outside world, um, I realized that so many hours of our lives are, are inside as well. And so that had to be accounted for. Um, and actually, I just thought of another question, which is not on my original list, which happens a lot on this show. Uh, the cows. <laughs> the cows play a very interesting role. Why, why the symbolism of, I, I kind of like the idea of the, the cows and the farm being um, bell and size touchstone to a reality that is outside of their small world. And it's still there, it's still present, but you see them less and less as 
as the book goes on. So why, why the symbolism of the farm and the cows and the, talk about that a little bit, I'm fascinated. <laughs> well, you know, um, the part of Ireland that I live in now is it's kind of bad farming land in that it's, mm -hmm. it's quite bumpy and the soil is bad. There's a lot of rock and there's not a lot of trees. Um, so it's generally farmland for cattle, for, um, uh, for cows even, not even so much sheep. There, there'll be more sheep up the West Coast. But mm -hmm. um, so for me, it was just, uh, I, I suppose I didn't so much think of them as symbolic. Well, I mean, they're symbolic in the sense that they, they change like the seasons the same way everything else does. So at certain times of the year, um, there are cows outside um, and around the house here. Uh, and then at other times of the year, they're, they're in at the winter. They're really only kept in in the worst time of year. But they're also, if they're bullocks, they're taken away to be slaughtered at a certain time of year. Um, and then in a different farm, not or just over the road, that's also depicted in the book, they're dairy cows. So so the, the rhythm of their day is very much, they go down to the parlor in the morning and they come back up again to the field and they go down to the parlor again in the evening and come back up again to the field. Um, and so for me, it was just a way of kind of um, drawing a full picture of, of what it's like to live here um, at this moment in time. Um, and so much of my, even my routines are dictated by the cows. Like it's funny, I'll take the dogs out now this evening. And um, if I go up the wrong road at the wrong time, then I'll get stuck in a cow parade on the way home, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, I, having, having spent a little time in the Midwest, you may, you may and, and where you live now, this may resonate with you. I was uh, on my way down the highway one day and uh, I, I had to pull over to the side of the road because the police had had blocked off part of the part of the roadway uh, because a cow had actually escaped from one of the farmers' fields in uh, in Minnesota. This is back in Minnesota, and the cow was out wandering around in the center of the roadway. Um, it's amazing to me that this happens, but it does. It's a thing. <laughs> We see that happens all the time here, um, but the roads are so quiet, nobody ever cares. Um, like I called, I phoned the farmer because there's been loose cows and he'll be like, oh, they'll, they'll wander back in again, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they'll come back. It'll be all right. So, and I, but I remember actually talking to Americans um, about the about cows and them being fascinated that you know, well, not fascinated, but that saying what a great thing it was that all the cows here were grass fed. And I, I'd be like, what? What else would they eat? What else could they possibly eat? <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's fair. They do. There, there are other things that you can feed cows, and then uh, yeah. And I mean, I, and I know that they, they they're kept inside um, in some countries. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so yeah, no, I've learned so much about from talking to people about cows and the different cow cultures. It's been fascinating. <laughs> Another thing I don't think has ever been said on this program or ever will be cow cultures. I love it. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, you had talked about a little bit about how the mountain, uh, what does the mountain uh, represent? What, what does that represent to you? you? You mentioned a little bit before, but I wanted to revisit that. Well, to me, the mountain is God. Um, mm -hmm. It, not literally, but yeah. um, I wanted it, like I say, I wanted it to be God-like. Um, you know, I mean, I've referred to the book as an allegory, and um, no one's really tried to draw that out with me, and I'm pleased because I'm not entirely sure what it is an allegory of, but it's definitely allegorical in tone. Um, definitely something I was really interested in in my writing in this book, but um, also very much in my art practice. It's something that I'm interested in. Um, it's It's sort of all these little you know, well, I should maybe say that I, like most Irish people, was raised Roman Catholic, and like a lot of Irish people, sure. don't practice it anymore, um, mm -hmm. you know, especially of my generation. Um, and I'm not, so I'm, you know, I, I don't practice a religion, but I'm very interested in religion, and I'm very interested in all these little kind of observances that we invent for ourselves in the absence of religion. Sure. So I'm really interested in ritual and in ceremony, and so the book was sort of in keeping with its slightly um, allegorical theme. Um, it was very much focused on all of these little um, little rituals that we invent for ourselves, really, in the absence of organized religion. And there's even, Bell and Sai have this sort of practice of blessing things, um, you know, and they right. don't know why they're blessing, <laughs> what the blessing means, other than um, other than there's this tendency inside them. And I very much have that as well. Perhaps it comes from my Catholic upbringing, um, but it's something that I think is is kind of important as well, that it's meaningful. Um, whole, I, I have to, I have to um, uh, 
<laughs> for some reason it wants to end our um it wants to, for some reason it wants to end our session in 10 minutes which makes no sense to me because it's never done that to me before but if we get if we get bopped off for some reason i will uh i'll send you another link and then we can finish up but um hmm. Okay. I think it's that Zoom has recently started doing that, just like a 40 minute cutoff. Well, yeah, but um, there's only two of us on here. So I don't know why it's doing that, but well, whatever. Whatever. Um it, it was it was kind of strange, uh, the process I went through while I was reading the book. Uh at first I thought that Bell and Cy were kind of weird. Uh, but then I started to envy them a little bit and envy their lives. Uh, I think it was only at the end that I came to realize through uh, Cy and Bell, I, I think I was looking at a mirror of what people value and what I value as a, as a human being. So am I imagining that aspect or was it intentional? Well, you know, it's I've had such a range of responses to this book. And sometimes I wonder, does it say more about the person who's responding than it does about the book? <laughs> to sure. But just out of um uh like for an example, you know, some people think that it's it's a lovely love story, like that it's very romantic because it's about these two people who are, you know, utterly devoted to each other to the exclusion of everyone else in the world. Um and then I've had other people say that you know it's it's a toxic relationship more or less you know um that it's a sort of a, a nightmare of monogamy um and uh and and sort of tragic that they lose their individual selves um so so it's interesting i i i mean like i'm not really answering your question am i no no that that's okay it's it is a um Actually, I think you answered it very well. I can see how different people would react to Cyan Bell differently, uh, and and I, I guess I would uh, I would challenge the people that say uh, that you talk about the, the tragedy of monogamy monogamy in that that relationship. I would I would argue that um, in many ways they found they have found what a lot of us as people have a hard time finding. They found what what suits them, what they love, what makes them complete. That's not always an easy thing to do. So that would be my counter to that argument, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I'm more I'm more inclined to think, uh, to, well, I don't know. I, I, I think that there's light and dark in it, definitely. Um, I certainly didn't set out to write something that was that was you know horrible, <laughs> um, you know that was that, that was very dark in its meaning. Um, but I don't think that it's 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 a sweet romance either. Certainly not. No. Um, I did want it to be about you know the things that we hold important to us, um, and you know essentially what's very important in the book is that they they make this decision to um, to leave no trace of themselves in the world in a sense. Um, and that for me is partly about, you know, like all my adult life, I, I've struggled with this wanting to be somebody, you know, wanting to be a success at what you do or a bit famous or what else. I think certainly anyone who's making art um, thinks about this. Um, and the book is sort of about um, showing these people as a model of perhaps what we should all be aspiring to, to just um, live very quiet lives and leave no trace because everything that we do is, is slightly detrimental to the planet. Um, and I'm not saying this is what I believe wholeheartedly, but I wanted to, to create a portrait of that in the book um, and to see how people responded, I suppose. It was, it was interesting to see the things that they, the things that we traditionally hold dear when you move into a place, uh, like the television, for example, you see it slowly but surely deteriorating over time, but it, it made me question the necessity of such things. Yeah, um, you see, that's an interesting one. That is based on truth because the television sort of broke down and many things, they break so slowly, you sort of adjust to their brokenness yeah. uh, and they seem fine. And that, and then it goes on like that for years and you realize you don't need them at all eventually. Exactly. Um, so I am going to read a little passage out of the book. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully I can do it justice and I don't sound like a complete idiot, but here we go. Um, I always like to say I'm not a complete idiot. There are some pieces still missing. <clears throat> At first, there seemed to be no path. And so they followed narrow partings in the dead bracken until they found, 
out the far side of the thickest layer of undergrowth that there seemed to be nothing but paths. Paths flowed across the mountain like the dry cracks of a convoluted river system, like the petioles of a living leaf, like the bronchi of a human lung. Paths opened in front of them as they approached and closed behind them as they passed. Uh, that is from the epilogue uh, at, the, at the end of the book. And to me, when, when I hit that spot in, in the book, I actually dog-eared the page and I never dog-ear pages because I'm, I'm one of those people that, you know, bookmarks, don't dog-ear people, don't dog-ear pages. But I didn't have the bookmark in my hand, so I dog-eared the page so I wouldn't lose it. Um, I have to tell you that at this point of the book, I, I kind of, it kind of caught my breath a little bit. Because to me, this was the point where the weight of the book's importance really struck me. Um, it felt like all of a sudden I'm, they were seeing uh, these tracks, these paths. You could interpret that as being humanity in a sense. And that we're all traveling up. We all eventually travel up our mountains standing in front of us, or at least we should. So am I, am I wrong with that? That point carried as much weight as it did? Uh, absolutely, that, that epilogue I spent a long time writing, or it's, it's a very important part of the book, I suppose, as every ending is. Um, but there's a lot of, yeah, sort of a hidden meaning in it. And I guess that's one of them. It's funny hearing you read it. It sounded almost scriptural. <laughs> Not sure that I'd realized that. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that um, had been on my mind, and I can't, I, I, I didn't read it in Emerson, but I got it somewhere else. But anyway, it's a quote by uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And it was, um, from the mountain, you see the mountain. And that's been going around in my head for years, this sort of idea that you get to the top of the mountain and then you realize that, you know, that, that the journey up um, was, was what it's about um, and that all you can see is, is what there is. And um, I don't know, like there's many possible interpretations of that. Um, but that was, that was very much um, something that was on my mind. And um, the other book I should probably mention is there's a little book called at the Living Mountain by a Scottish writer called Nan Shepherd. Um, she's not very well known at all and the book is very, very short and it's non-fiction. Uh, and it's basically just an account of um, the Cairngorm Mountains, which are in the middle of Scotland. Mm -hmm. And it's where she lived and she wrote this book in the 1920s, but it wasn't published in the 1970s. And that's a book that's very important to me because it really is just about her own relationship with this mountain and climbing it um, every day, every couple of days and how the flora and fauna changes and how much she learned from that, you know, how it kind of made her become a person. Person. Oh, that's, that's very interesting. That's fun. Um, I love it. I love it. So, uh, okay, so we've got one minute, 44 seconds before it says remaining time. So we'll see what happens in a minute, 40 seconds. Who knows? Uh, <clears throat> this book covers seven years, but in many ways, I argue it sort of covers a lifetime. Uh, I know it seems strange to non-authors to hear this, but were there times in the storyline while you were developing it that uh, it took the story took twists and turns that you didn't expect and that it actually surprised you? Um, I always had the ending in my head. Mm -hmm. um, so I was kind of working toward that. And uh, er, acro across the course of the seven years, um, those seven years, uh, take place. It's actually only the season cycle of the si single year, um, if you know what I mean. So it's the first chapter, which is a year, sort of covers January, February, I think, uh, and then March, April the 2nd, and then so on and so forth. So that was what I what was trying to, to cover. And then the, the seven years, I mean, seven is a significant number for many reasons. Um, yes. And partly it was because when I started the book, I'd been with my partner for seven years. So I thought I can write about a seven year relationship. I know how that works. Um, but also because there's this thing called the seven year itch. Um, you know, this is in, you know, urban, uh, urban lore or whatever. But there um, was a movie. Called the seven year itch, was yes. it? Yeah. God. I should look that up um, but it's sort of based on the premise that after seven years you either get married or you break up <laughs> and I've seen this a lot like it is true <laughs> yeah so the other thing is um, that they say that every seven years the body has completely renewed itself that every cell um, has died and come back again so um, so I suppose that was the reason for the seven years um, and the symbolism of that 
And I, I loved it. I did not miss the, the symbolism of the seven years. Um, and so I'm going to ask you a question now that I don't think I've ever actually asked anyone in all things writing before. Uh, y- you mentioned seven steeples being allegorical. And I think, uh, whether intentional or not, uh, there's so many different layers of things that I think anybody reading this book is going to be able to find something in there that is going to make you think very deeply about it. And um, I am, I'm curious, and like I said, I've never asked this question to anyone before. uh, Why did you write this book? You know, probably no one has ever asked me that before, (laughs) even though it's such a simple question. Um, For me, every book I've written has been, I've kind of felt compelled to write it, I suppose, um, that it's something that just, um, that won't go away. Um, and that it's not that I always know precisely how to express, you know, something that's niggling at me, but um, but uh, but I, I usually know how to start. Um, so, like I say, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to be someone who doesn't have to write to a deadline. Um, and I've been lucky enough to be able to keep, keep afloat financially with the books I do. So I kind of really only feel, um, really feel compelled to write, or, or, or it's when I feel compelled to write them that I write them. Um, mm-hmm. And so why did I write it? I, I guess this story, I, I, am, I feel that I am writing very close to nonfiction with everything I do. Um, so I, I always say that I think I have a terrible imagination and I have a huge amount of admiration for writers like you who can tell such like rich and complex stories and kind of move between a a lot of characters and have a lot of plot Um, like I'm terrible at plot Um, and so I write these very spare novels as a means of sort of um, uh, so you know (laughs) compensating for that and I suppose as a result of which I end up digging deeper because that's um, uh, that's that comes more naturally to me Um, so with this one I just felt um, I felt it was a story about about my time on the planet now. Um, it is a story about me and my partner and our dogs and the place that we live now, but it's it's also not true in, in, in most of its aspects, you know. And yet, <laughs> having said that, it's also perhaps it's most true because what's what matters most is in there. Um, and then the rest is sort of embellishment around it in a way. Um, so yeah, I, I wrote it because it's the same reason I wrote every book I've written so far. I'm just telling a story about um, about a period of time um, and the world that I know at the time that I live in it. Um, do you know, that's um, that's that's all I, all, I, all I know how to do really. <laughs> well, you, and you mentioned it being sparse and I, I would I would say, I mean, as far as novels go, I, I guess I could say sparse, but it's a very quick read. Uh, I found myself mm-hmm. Um, putting it down uh, when I had to go do cook dinner or, or whatever. And I'm like, wait, I'm just standing here. I should go read more. Um, I, I, and it's, it's very interesting to read something that um, it's lighter in terms of what I normally read. So I, I, I read uh, Ronald Malfi is one of my favorite uh, authors. Uh, he, he's actually local. He lives in Baltimore and uh, he writes these epic horror novels and they're dripping with, with everything and the worlds and the people and it's, a, it's very powerful and it's very full and it's very, and Seven Steeples uh, is sparse, but at the same time, it also has those deeper personal connections to the reader uh, that I think we really need. I think it's very important to have those things. And uh, dear listeners, when you when, when I say that you need to read wide, um, you need to step out of that, that mode where you're just reading the same things all the time, because guess what? You're just going to be uh, just like that other author. You don't wanna do that. You want to make sure and see what other people are bringing to the toolkits. This is why I love cozy mysteries, for example. I just like them. They're light, they're fun. They don't take a ton of time. Uh, This is why I like those mid-grade YAs uh, on occasion. Why? Because they're fun. They're not real, they're not real heavy. They're uh, uh, very much, I enjoy them. Um, But also uh, a book like Seven Seagulls puts you in a place where you have to think. It's introspection. And that's really, really important, I think. So uh, 
I love the book. I'm, I'm a huge fan. Uh, and, but I, I love to say, and, and the most important thing we ever ask on the show, the most important question we ever ask is, where can people find Seven Steeples? And your other books by, by, uh, by the same token. I don't, this is so terrible at this like America's a big mysterious like <laughs> country far away so I presume they're in bookshops <laughs> um, I don't I, know I, I, I mean you can definitely buy it online as well the publisher is Mariner and they are publish uh sorry the label has changed slightly but um I they have published HMH How the Missing Harcourt have published uh my previous two novels as well um so they should be out there they're probably not in every bookshop um but definitely you'll be able to get them on uh, online people still go to bookstores that's a thing <laughs> I just I order the books and the Amazon guy brings them it's amazing it's like I, amazing yeah well I'm afraid I'd be too but I live in such a remote place that you know I, I i try as as much as i can to order uh, mm -hmm. things from local bookshops or whatever but sometimes they just don't have what you want you know yeah we don't we here in northern virginia we don't really have that problem uh we're near dc the you know there's bookstores everywhere and uh if you want to pop into one and order whatever you can you can get it from the local bookshops um but uh, wherever you get seven steeples from, I know the larger bookstores, you can go in and, and order uh, books directly through them. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is get out there and order seven steeples, do it because it's well worth the read. You'll enjoy it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I can do nothing more than to tell you to read se the book seven steeples. Uh, please, read this book. Uh, yes, it's completely out of my normal wheelhouse, but I can tell you that I read it with an intensity that I'm not sure I have read too many books before. It, it really sort of drug me in and made me think. Um, and a book that makes me think is definitely worth the time. Uh, I know I'll be thinking about the lessons and the observations I took from it for some time to come, uh, but I, I suppose there's a central truth in, in my humble opinion that uh, Sarah's book kind of reveals. And that truth is that uh, we're all on a journey. And while those pathways may cross from time to time, those journeys are intensely unique, even when traveled together with someone else. So don't judge others, dear friends. Love one another and value those who join you along the way. Well, that is a about it for all things writing. I want to say thank you to my very special guest, Sarah, for joining me today. Thank you so much. I just, I love your interpretation um, and your reading of it um, so openly and so um, so deeply. I'm so, so grateful. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for writing it uh, because I very much did enjoy it. Uh, and if you enjoyed this show, good listener, please uh, hit that like button. If you're so inclined and wish to support my efforts, please consider a donation or join my Patreon as others have, where you can hear me read my books and other content that I normally don't put out there uh, for the world to see. Actually, uh, I recently put out a book cover that I'm likely never going to use for a novella that I wrote. So people get to see my strange uh, attempts at graphic arts, which are never very good because I'm not a graphic artist, but eh, I give it a shot anyway. Uh, I want to send out a shout to the good people uh, uh, of HarperCollins and, and Mariner Books for reaching out to me uh, to make this interview possible. It was their, um, uh, their um, uh, not public relations, what the heck is the word I'm looking for here? The, um, the public uh, publicist. No, not publicist. Uh, anyway, those are... <laughs> I'm going to try that entire sentence. Let me, let me, let me start from the beginning. I want to send a shout out to the good people of HarperCollins and Mariner Books for reaching out to me and making this interview possible. And of course, I need to thank again, my wonderful guest, uh, Sarah, for joining me. Uh, Sarah, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, I have to thank you dear listener, for joining us today on All Things Writing. On behalf of myself and my guest, author of the book Seven Steeples, Sarah Bauming, Sarah, ah, I screwed that up again. And the author of the book Seven Steeples, Sarah, this is Brian the Writer signing off. Wow, I, I'm just tripping all over my tongue today.
Ah, uh, no, no, no worries. Honestly, I, I find that like I, when I was listening to your podcast this week, I was thinking, 